Armored car driver James Moon makes a routine pickup from the Curtis Junior High School cafeteria. Moon has no idea that his every move is being watched. For more than 12 months, four hardened criminals went on a vicious crime spree in the Los Angeles area. Robbers without a conscience who specialized in armored car takeovers and brutal murders. Their year-long rampage of violence launched a dedicated manhunt. Tragically left more than eight people dead. I'm Brian Dennehy and this is Arrest and Trial. Detective David Kushner and his partner, Detective John Gensfain, have spent more than 25 years as homicide investigators for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Their extensive experience with street gangs proved invaluable during an investigation that began in 1996. <laughs> Detectives Kushner and Gensvein rolled onto the scene and were immediately confronted by pandemonium. There's been another armored car robbery today here in Southern California. When I first arrived there, there was utter chaos. It was so filled with people and, and news cameras that uh, it took almost an hour to figure out what was happening and where everybody was. How you guys doing? You guys are detectives? Yeah, what do we got here? Uniformed patrol officers already on the scene briefed the two investigators. Well, it looks like we have an uh, armored car robbery. We got a shootout. In the middle of the schoolyard lay the dead body of 43-year-old armored car driver James Moon. We have uh, shell casings over here. Not far from the victim, the casings of sophisticated automatic weapons littered the ground. You got one more thing you might want to look at. It's over this way. Spray painted on the side of the school was an ominous symbol. Signature graffiti used by gangs to mark the site of a shooting. Where this uh, particular guard had come out, Mr. Moon, where he was accosted, uh, were written the numbers 187, which is a penal code section for murder. It was obvious from the start that there was a gang connection because this was a gang-infested neighborhood that has been controlled by a small gang known as the Rich Crips, uh, whose territory includes the school. Ballistics matched shell casings found at the schoolyard crime scene to a weapon used to murder Manuel Garibay, a nighttime security guard and father of three. Garibay, who was murdered in his own home, had been subpoenaed to testify in a robbery case against a Carson gang member. Uh, just prior to the day that Mr. Garibay was to testify in court, gang members went to the Garibay residence and shot Mr. Garibay in the face four times as he slept. And then they very calmly walked out. The defendant in a robbery case was Bruce Millsap, the charismatic leader of a local street gang. Although there wasn't sufficient evidence to directly tie Millsap to the murders of James Moon or Manuel Garibay, there was enough evidence to warrant surveillance. Bruce Millsap was uh, 
little unusual. He's a uh, pretty bright individual, well-educated, uh, spoke very well. He was respected because of his age. He was uh, looked up to. He was referred to as a shot caller. Uh, and he was able to get these youngsters to really believe in him. And they did. They believed in him. And more importantly, they feared him. There were several of his own gang that were executed by his own gang. If you stepped out of line, you were executed. It was that simple. And the more people you kill in a gang like that, the more stature you have. Bruce Millsap was living a double life. To his wife and children, he was anything but a cold-blooded killer. Bruce started his day looking like the average loving father and husband. Uh, he actually seemed to maintain a worker's type of routine. He had left the house the same time every day with a shirt on for a local tow company. And within an hour, he was sitting outside of banks, casing them, getting ready for his next victim. Everyone feared Bruce Millsap. Even the most hardened detectives were troubled by the ease with which this cold-blooded killer silenced his victims. Although surveillance teams were watching Millsap's every move, he proved to be an elusive subject. Millsap had evaded us on numerous occasions playing games, knowing that he was being surveilled not only by helicopters, but by numerous unmarked vehicles. On November 3rd, 1996, Bruce Millsap escaped the surveillance team that was following him. Get out of the car, he's running, he's off, he's off. For several hours, his whereabouts were unknown. Going into the alley on the left side, going into the Then, word came of yet another armored car robbery that fit the M.O. of the Millsap gang. We're reporting live from the scene of yet another armored car holdup. Police officials have confirmed that Lamont Smith was killed. Witnesses say that the courier was shot in the back without provocation. Lamont Smith stumbled uh, to the armored car and threw the money inside and then fell over, over the money, still trying to protect the money. Uh, he died that day and they received no money that time. Ballistic tests on shell casings found at the crime scene confirmed that the same weapons that killed James Moon and Richard Garibay were used to execute Lamont Smith. But investigators still needed concrete evidence to charge Millsap with the murders. There were uh, a few breaks on the case, I would have to say, that really pointed us in the, in the right direction. A couple of the guns that we were looking for were discharged outside of a house in Carson where a opposing gang member lived. I believe there was nearly 200 shots fired that night into the house. There were shell casings everywhere. And in the clump of shell casings was a key with a key fob advertising a rental car agency. The key led investigators to gang member Emmanuel Brown. Emmanuel Brown was arrested for an unrelated offense and just happened to be in jail at the time, which was very convenient for us. Detectives connected Emmanuel Brown to the weapons used in the drive-by shooting, and more importantly, to the armored car robberies. As the list of suspects began to grow, so did the case against Bruce Millsap. Kendrick Lute was at a party one night and he walked up to a girl that he fancied and asked her to take him home with her. And she declined. So in front of her twin sister, he pulled out a 40 caliber semi-automatic and shot her in the back of the head. She survived and the evidence from that 40 caliber tied him to these robberies. Kendrick Lute was arrested and charged with attempted murder. 
While the investigation was going on, there was a robbery at a gun store in Lakewood. Very large shootout between three gang members and the owner of the store. Just hours ago, the owner of a Lakewood gun store miraculously escaped injury after a blazing shootout with members of a local street gang. Authorities say the gunfire erupted after the man refused to hand over guns during the robbery. Well, what do we got here? Well, basically, the owner says three male blacks. There was firearms evidence left all over that store from guns that we were interested in. And the ploy for the robbery first was to walk in and say, can I look at that box of ammunition? So where's the box at? I already placed an envelope right there. And Rashawn Colson picked up that box of ammunition and left a thumbprint on it. It tied to our other crimes, and we had another name to go with the group. The search warrant was based on the evidence inside the gun store, the fingerprint and the firearms evidence. And that night we also found the gun that we were interested in that fired those rounds. With the arrest of Roshon Colston, there was only one suspect left to bring in, Bruce Millsap. The problem was that Millsap at that point had disappeared, just totally. Millsap eluded authorities for many weeks, but finally slipped up when he made a call to Detective Gensvein on a mobile phone. I heard you looking for me. And when I'm on time, I realize y'all not gonna catch me. I'm too slick for y'all. Luckily, on the last day, he called me with a cell phone that we were aware that he had just recently stolen. Checking on y'all. I know y'all looking for me, I'm looking for you. We were able to do some triangulation and come up with a neighborhood that he was staying in. March 13, 1997, Put your hands up. Los Angeles County Sheriff's deputies, backed by a special enforcement bureau team, surrounded Bruce Millsap's car and placed him under arrest. Hey, step out of the car. Put that on your knees. A gun found in Millsap's possession at the time of his arrest was tested for ballistic matches. Like the other weapons, it too traced back to the armored car robberies. With four key members of the infamous street gang behind bars, homicide detectives David Kushner and John Gensvein hoped that it would only be a matter of time before one of the defendants would break rank. When uh, we interviewed Emmanuel Brown, Kendrick Lute, and Bruce Millsap, they all basically had the same thing. See my attorney. We're not going to talk to you. But Rashawn Colston decided after a while that he would speak to us. Rashawn Colston confessed his involvement in the crimes and also implicated his fellow gang members in the numerous armored car robberies and murders. He was aware that he was making a very dangerous decision because basically in a gang, if you decide to cooperate with the police, you've basically signed your death warrant, generally speaking. The case against Bruce Millsap and his street gang associates was in the hands of Los Angeles Deputy District Attorneys Kevin McCormick and Anthony Myers. Specialists in hardcore gang prosecution for over a decade, McCormick and Myers knew exactly what they would need to put these heartless killers away. The one thing we had going for us fairly early on was the fact that these people used a, a routine that was somewhat identifiable. They used the same guns in a number of the cases. Their approach to committing the armored car robbers is usually fairly consistent. They simply approached, began shooting, and then after they were done, they would try and uh, obtain the, the money. During the seven-week preliminary hearings, overwhelming evidence was presented against each of the defendants. The prosecution's pre-trial case had an unexpected effect on Emmanuel Brown. 
Early one morning, in his jail cell, Brown committed suicide. I think Emmanuel Brown hung himself because his most hopeful prospect was that he was going to spend the rest of his life in jail. And hanging himself was an easy way out. With Emmanuel Brown dead and Roshon Colston agreeing to cooperate, the remaining two defendants, Bruce Millsap and Kendrick Lute, were tried together. There were so many strands of evidence that uh, constructed the rope which we used to tie these defendants to the crimes. We had um, a fingerprint at a one crime scene. We had uh, phone records that we were able to use to prove certain connections. The most damaging evidence leveled against Millsap were the guns used to murder the victims. There was about four or so guns that were used consistently in a number of the crimes. These guns were able to be tied to Bruce Millsap or his Confederates. Millsap took the stand in his own defense and denied all charges. Got no idea about no armor cars. Well, essentially the defense was um, that Mr. Millsap didn't know what we were talking about. He had no idea uh, why all these people had testified that he'd been involved in all these horrible things. The trial of Bruce Millsap and Kendrick Lute lasted six and a half months after more than three exhaustive days of deliberation, the jury returned its verdict. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant guilty of the crime of first degree murder. Bruce Millsap was convicted of the first degree murder of eight people. Kendrick Lute was convicted of three murders. Millsap received eight death sentences, plus 200 additional years in prison. Kendrick Lute was also sentenced to death. When the judge uh, read the uh, sentences for Bruce Millsap, there was no reaction like you would expect. There was a lot of smiling, a lot of laughing. Death was appropriate in this case because these defendants, they were nightmares, they were predators, without a, a trace of compassion for the lives that they ended. You can't help the families of these people that have been taken away. I don't think justice can ever be served in a case like this. It just, it's too late. Bruce Millsap and Kendrick Lude are currently awaiting execution on San Quentin's death row. Rashawn Colston was later tried separately and found guilty of first degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. A parent's worst nightmare next when their newborn baby is abducted from the hospital by a woman posing as a nurse 